at you live tonight from the Hill household. Our topic tonight is accumulation functions. So before we dive right in, I just want to take a few seconds to review that second fundamental theorem of calculus. Now this is such a huge deal. So you'll recall, and we should have talked about this earlier, um, that we're given this integral and our goal is to take its derivative. And that's the second fundamental theorem, when you are taking the derivative of an integral. Now, we have a little way of doing that, but hopefully you'll recall that the derivative and the antiderivative, or the integral, should undo each other. So it should look pretty similar to what I'm actually integrating. So hopefully you'll recall, we said we're going to do two things. We're going to substitute in the upper bound. Okay, so I'm going to replace every t that I see with my x cubed, my upper bound. So I'm going to say that's x cubed sine of x cubed squared. And the other thing I have to do, so that was my first thing, is I have to take the derivative of the upper bound. So everything's about the upper bound. So if I take the derivative of x cubed, that's my upper bound, I should get 3x squared. So I'm going to multiply this answer by 3x squared. And when I clean it up, I'm going to pull my 3x squared times my x cubed. Remember, when you multiply, add exponents. So that's 3x to the fifth sine power to a power, actually, is multiply x to the sixth. Okay, and I've got my answer there. Okay, so let me give you one more to practice here. So again, I want to take the derivative of this integral. So pause me, try it on your own. Hopefully you're feeling good because we're going to need this idea throughout the next topic here. So I flip my bounds quickly because, um, again, I want my accumulation function, I want this variable to, be, variable to be up top, my upper bound, and I'm just going to plug that in. So I've got negative I've got 4x to the 4th plus 2. And don't forget, you substituted it in, and now take the derivative of the upper bound. So the derivative of 4x is 4. So I'm going to clean it up one more step. I'm going to say that's negative 4. And that's 256x to the 4th plus 2. Or again, if you want to leave it, just make sure you have those parentheses around it. Okay, we're going to focus on one question today with a bunch of little parts to it. So, we're given this accumulation function. And I know that because this upper bound here is an x. So it's just going to accumulate area until you tell it to stop. So it's very, very important that you understand who you're staring at and what's given. So this says the graph of f is shown and g of x is this function here. So let's go ahead and label this graph with a big F. All right, so just keep saying to yourself, this is a graph of f. Now, just like we normally would, go ahead and pause it and let's take some time and fill in all these areas. I'm going to break it up into shapes that look familiar and calculate each of the areas. Uh, and you can do the same thing there. So just pause me and fill in those areas. So you can quickly verify my areas. I did a nice triangle here, another triangle here. It's below, so it's negative. A uh, nice rectangle, triangle, triangle. Now for this bear here, um, that's that tricky one. I built a rectangle, 4 by 4, so I said that's 16. And then I subtracted half the circle here. So 1 half pi r squared, that got me the 2 pi. And then an area of 2 here. All right, so now we're ready that we have these var variables in there to attack the first question. So question one. Question one is just to find g of negative four. So again, be very careful. You're given a lot of information. This graph is f, and this function up here is g. So you are strictly plugging your negative four into this function g. So I'm going to rewrite it as g of negative four equals the integral from one to negative four of f of t dt. Now, I want to be clear that I did not plug that negative 4 into both an x and a t. I'm finding g of negative 4, and that's taking the place of this x here that I'm pointing to. So that's going to replace every x, not the t. So to evaluate this, I just have to say to myself, okay, the bounds are backwards, so I'm going to pull a negative out and switch the bounds. And it's okay, man. 
from negative four to one. I'm just gonna calculate that area, and it looks like if I'm looking here, an area of negative eight and one, negative nine, and of course the negative out front's gonna make that a positive nine. So hopefully nothing earth shattering, something we've done before, but just be very careful who you're plugging these functions into. All right, let's try another one here. Um, number two, nice and easy, g of one. Okay, so again, I'm just gonna look at my functions. G is this function up here. I'm replacing the x value here with a one, so that means I'm only gonna replace the x's with a one. So g of one is the integral from one to one of f of t dt. Hopefully, you don't have to do any math. How much area have you accumulated if your bounds don't change, if they're the same number? Have you moved at all? Hopefully, you're saying no, and that's an area of zero. Now let's try to squeeze another nice one in there. Uh, number three. Let's say we want g of three. Okay, so again, I'm just replacing the x with the three. So one to three of f of t dt. And I'm just gonna look at that area starting at one. So I'm starting here, I'm just gonna eat up some area till I get to three. So I would say that's a nice four. And hopefully you've got the idea there. So let me step it up just a little bit and talk more about you know some more higher level calculus here. Let's say we now wanted to find, for number four, g prime of zero. Okay, so we're gonna slow down here, g prime of zero. So I'm gonna go back to my g function, all right, and that's this guy up here. And I wanna take its derivative, and that's what we, we talked about in class earlier and what we, we reviewed on the video here. I wanna take the derivative of g, and g is an integral. So that's called that second fundamental theorem of calculus. We're gonna take that upper bound, plug it in, replace it with that t, and then take the derivative of the upper bound. So it's just all about the upper bound. So hopefully you're saying that g prime of x is equal to f of x, and the derivative of that upper bound is one. So I'm really just gonna get f of x. And this is huge. g prime of zero is equal to f of x. And lastly, I'm just gonna plug in the zero that they're telling me, so I'm really gonna get f of zero. So now I've gotta determine what this value is. And if I go back to those directions, they told me this is a graph of f. Okay, so I'm just going to evaluate f of zero, which means I'm gonna stare at this graph, I'm gonna find my zero, and look where my graph is sitting. And it is sitting at negative two, a height of negative two. So f of zero equals negative two. All right, let me give you another one. And again, you know, pause it, try it on your own, see if you get the same answer. G prime of five. So the derivative of G again is F of X, and I want it at five, so F of five. So I'm just using my graph and evaluating my function at five. If I look at five, it looks like it has a height of two. Okay. All right, moving on, talking even more calculus. All right, number six. This time I wanna know g double prime of five. So I've gotta slow down and take two derivatives. So I just rewrote my g up here, so I had it in front of me, and I'm gonna get g prime first. So, and we've done this before, we said g prime equals, this is the second fundamental, take that upper bound, plug it in, f of x, the derivative of the upper bound is one, so we get f of x. Therefore, if I want g double prime, I'm just gonna take the derivative one more time. So that's equal to f prime of x. Okay, so g double prime equals f prime of x. So I'm really finding, when I say g double prime of five, right here, I'm really implying the same thing as f prime of five. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to f, which is the actual graph, and instead of looking at its value at five, I want f prime, I want its derivative or slope at five. So let me scroll back and find that graph. I'm gonna go to five, one, two, three, four, five, and again, here's five, and I'm looking at its slope at five. So I would say that definitely has a slope of zero. So this would be equal to zero. All right, let's try another second derivative. If I want g double prime of one. Okay, so I've already taken my second derivative here. That implies the same thing as f prime of one. 
So I'm going to use my function f, I'm going to go to 1, and I'm going to look at the slope again. So here's 1, and my question is, what is the slope? Now, you'll notice that this is linear, so anybody who lies on this line here is going to have the exact same slope. Whether you're at 2, or 2.5, or 1.5, anybody on this line will have the same slope. So it's pretty basic. All I need to do is figure out the slope of that line. And instead of doing the slope formula, I think we can just basically count rise over run. So it looks like I'm going to go up 2 and over 1. So anybody sitting on that line again has a slope of 2. So our final answer there should be 2. All right, so keep chugging here. Find the x-coordinate of any relative maximums of g. So again, the details are so important. You don't have to guess. First of all, I see the word relative max. All right, so that trigger word in your head should be saying set the derivative equal to 0. Okay, when in doubt in calculus, set a derivative equal to 0. Maxes, mins, um, critical points, etc. Now, you don't have to guess which derivative to set equal to 0. It should tell you. And it says the maximum of g. All right, so on every notebook, every paper, you've got to say g prime equals 0. That is one point on our exam. They have to see that. They have to know that you understand maximum means the derivative of g equals 0. Okay, so again, I'm just going gonna, gonna to take that derivative one more time. I know we've done it a bunch, but we're going to do it again. g prime of x is equal to that second fundamental. Take the upper bound, plug it in f of x times the derivative of the upper, which is just 1. And of course, you want to set that equal to 0. That's the whole key. Set the derivative equal to 0. So what is this really saying? It's just asking you, when is the graph of f equal to 0? So all you have to do is really look at your picture and ask yourself, when does this graph equal 0? So got to scroll back here. If I look at this, this is f. When is it equal to 0? Well, I can clearly see if I look at this line 0 three times. Once here, here, and here. So I should have three critical points on that chart. So again, I'm looking here and here, and at that end point. So scrolling back, I'm going to make myself a sign chart. All right, at this point, it's not an option. You have to have g prime slash f here. That is what you are describing, g prime slash f. Okay, we want to see that on every paper. It's not an option. So I'm looking to see when it's equal to 0, and now I'm just looking to see where the graph is sitting. So it should be above, below, and above, which tells me that my function is increasing, decreasing, and then increasing, creating a max and a min. And this is describing function g. So it's not an option. We have to have these labeled off to the side. Uh, so to answer the question, I have a relative max at x equals negative 7. Justification, g prime slash f changes from positive to negative. All right, next question. What is the absolute maximum value of g? So again, there's no guessing here. It straight up tells you maximum. Taking a derivative, setting it equal to 0. Of who? g. So on every paper, g prime of x equals 0. We are setting the derivative of g equal to 0. Now, we've already stated from that second fundamental that g prime of x is actually equal to f of x, and we're setting that equal to 0. And we already got those values. Now, our key here was to make an absolute. So that's where we make that t chart. Okay, we put our x values here. And again, you don't have to guess what to put in the second column. It wants the maximum value of g. That's who goes here. It tells you. There's no guessing. Now, an absolute, remember, you have to use the endpoints and the critical points. And we got those in this previous question. Our critical points were negative 7 and 1, and our endpoints were negative 8 and positive 8. So that's who I'm using. Negative 8, negative 7, 1, and positive 8. 
Now, since I want a max, I can already kick out one because we know one is a min. So I'm not going to waste my time evaluating that. I'm just going to make a note on my table that this answer is a min and I don't actually care about it because I just wanted the absolute max. Now, to find these other values, all I have to do is plug them into g. And recall, g is the integral from 1 to whatever that bound is of f of t dt. This goes from 1 to negative 7 of f of t dt. This is going to go from 1 to 8 of f of t dt. Okay, I'm just plugging them into g. Just common sense, plug them into g. Now, you're going to have to evaluate each of those integrals. And we did uh, a couple of them. I don't know if we did any of those previously. But basically, you're just going to read your chart and come up with those answers. So my first integral went from 1 to negative 8. So I'm going from 1 here to negative 8 here. I'm going to add up those areas. Um, so that's negative 1 and negative 8 is negative 9. Negative 12 plus 1 is a negative 11. And then, holy smokes, Bailey. The bounds were backwards, so that's going to turn that into a positive 11. So for my first answer, I should be getting positive 11. My second integral is going from, let's see, 1 to negative 7. So again, the bounds are backwards, so I'm going to have to negate my answer. I'm just going to scroll up and look at my, my chart. So 1 to negative 7 uh, is 8, 9, 12. That's a negative 12. And again, I'm going to flip it to make it a positive 12. Bailey. Now, even though I said this is a min, I could easily evaluate it because it's just 1 to 1. So we do know that answer is 0, but again, we didn't care about it. And lastly, I need 1 to 8. I'm not going to switch the bounds at all. And 1 to 8 looks like 4, 6, plus 16 minus 2 pi. So again, I'm just adding from 1 to 8 here. So I've got myself 22 minus 2 pi. Now I just need to evaluate them to see who's the largest. Um, and obviously 2 times pi is like 3.14, so that's a little bigger than 6. If I subtract that from 22, I would definitely say that this term is the largest. So to the answer the question, the absolute maximum value is 22 minus 2 pi. And this occurs at x equals 8. Okay, last question for the night. On which interval is g concave up? So again, there's no guessing. They say the letter g, concave up, in your head, should be two derivatives. And again, set it equal to zero. So the first derivative is the second fundamental. Take the upper bound, plug it in. Derivative of the upper bound is, of course, 1, so times 1. Second derivative, I'm going to take this guy's derivative, which is really just going to be f prime of x. And I'm setting that equal to 0. So I'm going to go back to that picture of f, but this time I'm going to look at all the slopes. Okay, so like I said, remember this is a graph of f, and I'm going to look at the slopes and set them equal to 0. Now remember, I care when a slope equals 0 or does not exist for my critical points. So I'm going to label this top as g double prime slash f prime, and this is describing g. i got to start off at my endpoint of negative 8, and I'm describing my slopes. So I'm not looking where I'm sitting. I'm saying this section has a slope of a negative value until I get to this point, And I have to stop it there because the slope does not exist. And I want you to put a does not exist symbol above it. Then my slope is going to continue to be negative until I get to this point where, again, the slope is not going to exist. And what is that? Negative 4. Then I have a whole bunch of zero slopes until I get to zero itself. Then I would say these are all positive slopes until I get to, uh, what is that, 3. Then I have negative slopes until I get to 5. Positive slopes till I get to 7. And then negative slopes till I get to 8. Now again, I want to make a point that at 3, the slope does not exist. At 5, it exists. It just has a slope of 0. And at 7, the slope does not exist as well.